And I ask, Lord, a prophetic tongue that your word, quickened, anointed, will come forth in impartation into the inner depth of our spirit. Oh, Lord, quicken your word that it will flow not to our head, but to our spirit. Cause it to become spiritual food, life with direction and purpose for each of our lives. And I ask, Lord, for each of us that we will receive a portion, a word that will challenge, encourage us, and give direction and purpose to our daily walk with you. And very carefully, Lord, we glorify you and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You won't need to turn to this because I guess I use it every meeting. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. I stand at the door and what? Knock. Amen. That's the urgency of the hour in which we live. It's at the end of the church age. I mentioned the word parousia, the presencing of the Lord. He's at the door knocking. And this is what he's saying. If anyone hears, anyone, if anyone, who's anyone? Who? You and I, each one of us, if anyone. That's the individual. If, we're, if we'll hear, the world has never tried harder to distract us to keep us from hearing anything that's spiritual. The world has never worked harder at energizing our carnality, if there be any. Hopefully there isn't. But if there's any there, the world will energize it. They're working diligently at it. But we're being lifted, set apart. Whew. Hallelujah, glory. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Lord, just let your word flow out. Touch your people. Enable us to hear, to be willing, Lord, to go beyond our present experience. Lord, grant the prophetic enabling to speak your heart through this word. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I stand at the door and knock. The urgency. If anyone hears and opens, we're going to share some. Usually, I always have an outline. I've, all these years, I, I've never got past having one. I hardly ever follow it, but I always feel I have to have one. And usually, the first part has to do with something that I want to say, and the last part is how to enter into it. And we never get to the second part. And so what I'm going to attempt to do is substantially cut down the first part and spend some time on the second part. I've never done it. I don't know if I'll succeed or not, but we're going to try. If we will listen and begin to pay attention and separate ourselves from the distractions that are so rampant, we will begin to hear the voice of the Lord. Much of my prayer life is this, Lord, I thank you that I can hear, but no matter how well I'm hearing, I can hear what? Better, thank you, I can hear better, I can hear more clearly. I can hear something further, and I greatly desire. Have you ever wished the Lord would just come and talk to you about some things we all do? Lord, I, I just love to sit down, and I've got quite a few questions I'd like to ask. <laughs> One thing I've always wondered about is mosquitoes. <laughs> Someday I'm going to ask the Lord, why? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if anyone hears my voice, I will come in into 
See, this is the real emphasis. The Lord is looking for a people that he can come where? Into. Not a people looking out there someplace to fly away, getting ready to go with their suitcase packed. But rather, he's looking for a people that he can what? Come within their lives. The Lord is seeking. See, I'll come in and I will sup with you and what? You with me. That's that conversation I'd like to have, a two-way conversation. I'll never, uh, John Follett, I mentioned his name many times. He was speaking at a meeting in, in, this was July of 1959, I still remember. And the anointing came on him so heavy, right in the middle of the message, that he forgot where he was. And he's carrying on a personal conversation with God. And he's talking to God, and God's responding. We didn't hear it, but he's, he's hearing. He's nodding his head and agreeing. Then all at once he stopped and stood there a minute, looked a little puzzled, and he said, where am I? And then he realized where he was, and he apologized to the people and started speaking again. That was very real. He had that level of relationship. That's a challenge. I'm not there, and I don't think you are either. But I would like to be, but I saw it. I saw it, and I'm challenged by it. I will come in, and I'll sup with you. We're in the time of the parousia, the presencing. In the last days, the world is working towards a realignment, that's the word, of nations. The sheep and goat nations are being identified and realigning. And Islam is going to make a pretty bad mistake. They're going to be greatly embarrassed. And there's going to come some realignment. Glory, hallelujah. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We need to pray to that end. If anyone hears, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. A verse that I love, and this one, if you want to, you can look at it. Psalm 42, verse 7. Punctuation was added by Stevanus, a man named Stevanus, in the 1400s, and so we can change it. And I'm going to change the punctuation in this verse. Deep calls to deep, period. I'm going to add a period there. If you have a, any other translation, it probably has a comma. Deep calls to deep. Now, the next part. That's God seeking out. That's Jesus knocking at the door with desire. I'll come in and sup with you. The Lord longs for communion, for fellowship. He longs for it. Our part is hearing because he's talking a heavenly language. And as we become quiet, we can enter into that and we'll begin to hear. If he has to, uh, <clears throat> I remember Walter Butler, another man that had an unusual walk with the Lord, said one time, it's no compliment when God speaks to you audibly. <laughs> said, he said, that simply means he couldn't reach you any other way. <laughs> And, you know, that's dangerous because I, I've been guilty of this. Now I'm getting off, but I'll, Lord. <laughs> I have said, Lord, I need a word about doing this. Should I do it? or should? And the Lord will speak to me and tell me. And I'll put a value on it. I heard, and if I say on a scale of, say, 1 to 10, I heard about number 3. You know, on 3 on the scale, it was kind of faint. Now I have something that's more important. This is why I said speaking audibly is dangerous. Now I have something that's more important. And so I say, Lord, I had something that was not quite as important, and you spoke on a scale of three, and this is more important, so you're going to have to speak a five or six. You've got to speak even louder, because this is more important, so it has to be louder. See, and then I'm limiting God. See, and I'm expecting something. And I'm limiting my ability to hear because I'm putting a false measure on it. 
And so the Lord often doesn't speak the way we would like him to speak. I had a very nice job one time, and I was paid a dollar and five, this was quite a while ago, the pay was a dollar and five cents an hour. That was, that was the pay, dollar five cents an hour, and it was hard work, real hard. I worked five hours a day for dollar five cents an hour. And they would tell me what to do. They'd say, do this and do this, and then they'd yell at me because I wasn't doing it the way they thought I should, and I get yelled at, and so I kind of tried a little harder. And then at the end of the week, I would go and say, now I've done what you told me, I want my pay. I've done it, now I want to get paid. Well, if the Lord starts to tell me everything like that, tell me what to do, where to go, what to think, my relationship would become that of an employer and an employee. And I would do all that he said, and I'd say, now, Lord, I've, I've done what you've said, now I want my pay. The Lord said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm developing a relationship on an entirely different level. I'll guide you with my what? My eye. That's the highest guidance, that you get to know someone well enough that they don't need to say a word. A amen. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. See, we know by the very presence, by the inflection, by that present, that resident presence of the Lord, the peace of God arbitrating within our lives. Deep calls. God is a seeking God. Our problem is, is hearing on the level that he desires us to hear in the way that he desires us to hear. Now, because of this, because I'm just beginning, at the noise of your water spout, the noise, that's interesting. If you have anything but a King James, it will say at the sound of your waterfalls, and that ruins it. Absolutely ruins it. It's at the noise of your water spout. These are, this water spout is a horizontal water spout. It happens two places in the world, in the mountains outside of Jerusalem and in Hong Kong Harbor in Kulun. Only two places with this horizontal, I have a picture of one. And all the rain is whipped together in sort of a funnel. That rain that falls on the fields of the just and the unjust, it's whipped into a, like, like a funnel of water and it dumps on one person. That's the favor of God, the approbation of God. The Lord becoming powerfully active within your life, within my life. And I really, in the beginning, I don't understand I was just up to Pinecrest and did the installation of a new president, the fourth one. And back in 1959, I received a word from the Lord about that I would be, start a Bible college, a Bible school, that I was to start it, and I knew where I was to start it exactly. And I could write a book on how it happened, literally. And then the Lord spoke to me and told me that I was to come to Washington, D.C., a very specific, clear word. And here I are. But I can think back to that word. And I had all kinds of ideas until finally the Lord said, everything that you've thought of is automatically eliminated. <laughs> when it happens, it's not going to be any way that you think. And that's exactly what happened, exactly. So much so that I almost doubted it when it happened. Because I had eliminated so much, there wasn't anything left. <laughs> but all kinds of ideas as to how, you know, this happened and this happened and I'd line them together and you wouldn't do that. But I take these little events and put them together and line them up and say, oh, th that means this and that and this is going to happen and well, it never did. And the Lord said, you've eliminated everything. Noise, we don't understand. The Lord is bringing us, seeks to bring us into a higher level of understanding. But if, we, and I, this, this was a long time ago. I thought back and that the Lord spoke that to me clearly. It was in October of 1959 that I knew what would happen. 
And then it happened. I wondered, I had this word about Washington, D.C., and I told quite a few people, I've never been in Washington, D.C. I don't know anyone there. I wouldn't know what to do. I, I didn't feel anything. The Lord said, You're, you will be there. Well, I'm just absolutely amazed. I left the Bible school, walked out with nothing, came here with nothing, and I look at what's happened, and I mean, I, to this day, I absolutely marvel at what's happened. The Lord's created something out of nothing, and I marvel, and I count it a privilege to be here today. Noise, I didn't understand, and everything I figured got eliminated. But something, as I've walked with the Lord, something is happening. See, at the noise, your water spout, the favor of God, the approbation of God, resting on a life to bring us through to a destined point. It's in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. Revelation chapter 5. See, at the noise. Now, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they what? They sang a new song. Sung or sang a new song. See, that noise has become a song. And I can look back now. And if I could sing, I would have a song. And I'm asking the Lord about that. Someday I might surprise you. Because I'm really asking the Lord. I, I can't sing at all. I, music, I, I don't understand it. I can't. But someday I'm going to sing. They sang a new song. That's a new song. See, something had happened. And the Lord in that interval between the noise and that new song, the song of Moses and the Lamb, a song of identity. You've made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall what? Reign. Where? On the earth. So we're being prepared as a governmental people to govern literally the millennial kingdom, to bring the judgments in the closing out of the church age and the government. See, the very ones... Satan deceived Adam and Eve and laughed at God. The Lord said, you bruised their heel, but they will bruise your head. And the Lord in his infinite wisdom is using the very ones that Satan deceived to bring him down, to destroy him and his kingdom, and to bring in the judgments and the millennial kingdom. It's going to come through a body of overcomers. Thou hath made us. That's a processing. That's the ministry. That's why we're here today. We're being made. That is, we're being prepared. You've made us. In Revelation chapter 19, it says, His wife, the bride, has made herself ready. Hath made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall what? Rain. See, now, the noise has become what? A song. I have understanding. And we're working towards that in preparation. And that's going to come through a direct point of intervention. We're going to be lifted into a higher realm of authority. We're going to, our eyesight is going to become as a flame of fire. It's going to be ju judgment. We're going to see and understand. And they'll flow out in authority. The word with what? Consequence. Today we're living in the day of grace. There is no consequence. But that's coming. You've made us kings and priests. As a king, I'm going to rule with the Lord as a son. As a priest... I'm going to minister to the Lord as a bride. It's the two sides of the same coin. I'm going to minister to the Lord as a bride in a relationship with him. And then in that relationship, I'll become one with him so that he, the corporate, the head and the body, united together, will function in the outworking of his purposes There's an interesting verse. It's in Daniel chapter 7. I'm just going to mention it for a moment 
and one other thing, and then we're going to, and I'll come back to this, because I want to talk just a moment about the wheel within the wheel. The Lord's getting us ready for that. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. The Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. You can read this in Revelation chapter 1. It's the description of Jesus. His hair was pure, like pure wool. His throne like the fiery flame. That's the eyes as a flame of fire. And his wheels as burning fire. That's glory. That's moving. Wheels speak of movement. And this has to do with God the Father being in control, full control of the universe, of all creation. That wields the outworking of his higher purposes. It speaks of myramids, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, the host of heaven and all that goes on and all creation. This wields his oversight, but he's given Satan who rose up in rebellion He's given him a temporary authority. He said he could rule in effect better than God. And the Lord is permitting it for a season. And all creation has seen how Satan rules. Hatred, war, violence, wrath, death, famine, on and on. Sickness and disease. They have never seen how God rules. Because the word we received, he rules where? Presently within our lives. And we can never rule others until we have submitted to his rule over first over what? Our lives. And that's the emphasis today that we're being prepared and made ready. And so his wheels. Now Ezekiel chapter 1 for just a moment. We're going to come back to this in some future meetings. Verse 16, the appearance of the wheels. And their work was like unto the color of barrel. That's the color, of, that's glory. And they four, the overcomers, the type, had one likeness. We're the body, he's the head. What's seen is Jesus. Their work as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. So then, we are being prepared for the higher purpose of God. And when that wheel that controls the universe, when Satan's time has come to an end, there'll be a point of intervention and there'll be a lifting up and an empowering of an overcoming people. And the wheel that we're becoming, the expression of his life in moving in harmony with him, in obedience, you see, we're being prepared and the Lord is beginning to speak to us. And it might be a simple word, like you walk by a piece of paper on the floor and the Lord said, turn around and pick it up. Say, well, that's stupid. Well, it is, but it's, it's a step of obedience. You see, and it's just simple things where we're being disciplined and then comes the more important thing. And we're being prepared and trained. And so we're beginning to hear and in obedience, and all this is preparation for the greater day. We're obeying now, but if we're not obeying now, we'll not be able to obey in that day. And so we're being prepared. The Lord's beginning to speak. And no matter how simple it may be, and most of these things, there's no real outworking of it. Like there isn't any, the full outworking. We're just obedient, and that's it. Because what the Lord wants is that step of obedience and the fact that we're responding to hearing. Someone, you know, when the children of Israel crossed the Red, came out of Egypt and came to the Red Sea, they didn't have the level of revelation that they later had. And so when the Egyptians came, the Red Sea parted in front of them and they walked in on dry ground. But then they received in the wilderness, they had the pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day. They had manna. There was provision. They were fed by the Lord. They had guidance, direction, the pillar of fire and the cloud. When it moved, you move. When it stays, you stay. Then when they came to the Jordan, 
To whom much is given is much required. The priests were to take the ark and they were to walk into the flooded Jordan. And the word said, when the soles of your feet touch the water, the water will recede under your feet. Well, if that had not been the Lord, what would have happened? They would have drowned it. So someone said to me once, I think the Lord is saying this, but I'm not totally sure. I said, well, just go ahead and try it. And if it's the Lord, the water will part. If not, you'll drown. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if it's something that's not really critical, that's one way to find out. <laughs> But you see, we, I, I probably learn more by the things I've done wrong than I have by the things I've done right. Because it becomes a lesson and I learn and I go back and I get it right. So I learn. And so these wheels, verse 12 of Ezekiel chapter 1, they went every one straight forward. Whither the spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. That's, that's the difficult part. It's nice to do detours and stop off. You know, sometimes the Lord gives, gives a word, and that word is for a particular place at a particular time. And I've learned the hard way that if the Lord gives me something like that and I tell someone, when I speak it out, it's, it's gone. It's gone. And when I get to where I should be, there's no power. The word is void. I've learned that one the hard way. When there's a word, you keep it. And the word is not, sometimes a word comes in the presence of the Lord in a meeting and then it gets shared when it's really not for this meeting at all. It's a word that you're to hold and, and you're in an atmosphere where you could receive it. You need to know. It's a word in season. There's a timing. A word in season to him that's weary. So there's the right word, the right time, the right place, and the right person. And so we're going beyond just receiving and giving. We're learning how to be directive and speak a creative word directly to the right person at the right time. And the Lord's teaching us. Now, I'm up to where I want to be. This is the part I look at my watch and say, well, I'll have to skip it. And I'm doing a little better because no one's gotten up and walked out yet. So we're all right. We still have some time. John chapter 6, verse 1. Now, how do the, this work of preparation and our getting ready, I'm just going to share a couple principles. John chapter 6 and verse 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Verse 2. A great multitude followed Jesus. Now if you're there, why were they following? Because why? They saw miracles. They were observers. They came to see a good show. And I've said this in the meetings. I, I respect Benny Hinn and I've never been to one of his meetings, but I'd like to go sometime. And if I were to go, I would sit there and watch what he's doing and, and admire what's happening and clap and thank the Lord for, for what's happening and the testimony. I would be an observer. They followed because they saw miracles. When they were hungry, he fed them loaves and fishes. He, the Lord is faithful. He will meet our needs miraculously, a creative miracle. But when they came back and said, do it again, and I mentioned this earlier in the communion service, he, he multiplied loaves and fishes. A little lad had five loaves, two fishes. He multiplied it till the whole multitude was fed. And there's a principle in this that I'm still asking the Lord about. It has to do with end time provision because the Lord told them they were to remember the numbers. There was 12 basketfuls left over. This has to do with an end time provision. 
five loaves, two fishes. They ate, they were full. And there's coming a time when food shortages and all, when we would be thankful if the little bit that we have is multiplied. And the Lord is speaking this as a principle. They saw the miracle. They were fed, nurtured, they received. And this would fit perfectly into the prosperity gospel and all the blessings and provision. And that's all good. It has its place. But when they come back and said, do it again, what did Jesus say? I have something better. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have no life. Your fathers ate manna and they're dead. But if you'll eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll live forever. And they said, isn't that wonderful? No, oh, they didn't. What did they do? They scorned, they ridiculed, and they left. And I can think back quite a few years ago of a group that was praying for visitation. And the Lord began to move in a particular place in visitation. And they got together and said, this is not what we were expecting, therefore it's not the Lord. Well, it was very much the Lord. But they were measuring what the Lord was doing by past experience and by some vision or, that they had as to what they thought should happen. And so they were not ready. And so the multitude gladly received loaves and fishes. They received the message of prosperity, you know, prosperous. If you put $5 in the offering, you'll get a check for $1,000 tomorrow, something like that which you've never heard here and you never will. We give as unto the Lord. But <clears throat> they were limited. They were limited to an understanding on an earthly level. And the Lord said, I want to take you further. And they had no capacity to receive it. They scorned, they ridiculed, they left. And he said to the 12, will you also leave? But they said, to whom shall we go? They had a further understanding and they stayed. In Luke chapter 5, there's contrasts are sometimes powerful. This is a multitude that followed them because they saw miracles. Luke chapter 5, Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 5. Verse 1, the people, it came to pass that the people, what? They pressed upon them to what? To hear the word of God. In John chapter 6, they came, why? To see miracles. These people came to hear the word. See, there was a further work within. It was quite different. They pressed. The others were observers. They came to see miracles. These people came to what? To hear the word. So he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. There's two ships. There always are. His way and our way. There's that which is the Lord and that which is, is what I want to do. There are two ships. There always is. His way and my way. And he stepped into one of them. So I want to be in the one that what? That he's going to get into. The fishermen were gone out of them washing their nets. We're all fishermen. We fish for security, for love, for acceptance, for resources, provision, friends, fellowship. We, we fish for all kinds of things. But these fishermen were washing their nets. The net's the thing that we use to get what we want. See, their methodology is being changed. And he said to Simon, thrust out from the land a little, and he sat down and taught them, push out into the realm of the spirit. Now, two things. The motive of our heart in seeking the Lord has to be right. We can be seeking him because we want to see miracles or blessing or prosperity or whatever it may be. We're seeking for our own benefit. Or we can be seeking 
for a higher purpose, to make ourselves available to him. So then, these were responsive to the Lord. There were two ships. He knew that there was a hunger, a desire. And he began to lead them in the direction that he would have them to go. Therefore, he pushed out a little from the land and taught them. Then later he said, launch out into the deep. So there's a preparation for the deeper things of the spirit that we're presently involved in. So there has to be a willingness. I mentioned this group that rejected the move of God because it wasn't the way they thought it should be. See, if you read church history carefully, you'll find out that the persecutors of each visitation were the recipients of the previous visitation. You can document that. The recipients of each visitation became the persecutors of the next one. That can be absolutely documented down through church history. Why? Because the Lord does not repeat himself. And in each move, they're looking for something similar that they're familiar with to happen. And, what, and the Lord does something totally different. So they reject it. There has to be a new wineskin a sensitivity, a willingness to go further. That's the first aspect. Now, what the Lord is doing will have to fit within the context of Scripture. Always does. If it doesn't fit within the context of Scripture, it should be rejected. I lost a friend recently because he printed an article that was totally wrong. It should have never, never been put in print. And I emailed him and told him, and I lost a friend. But that's all right, because it, was, it, it, would, it would lead to spiritual confusion and death. It should have never, ever been put in print. There are things out there that, we do, that have to measure up to the word. This did not measure up to the word at all. There's two ships. There's always choices that we have to make and by the grace of God if we're making the choice at least in our hard intention because the Lord looks at the heart that will take us closer to him then he will bring the needed correction to adjust my walk and he's faithfully done that so then there has to be a willingness to go beyond our present experience. We may not understand, but we've got to trust him. The Lord's beginning to pour out new wine recently. I was involved in a visitation in 1958 where there was a fountain of new wine that flowed like a river. And it was 160 students was in Bible school on the floor laughing hysterically. And I was right in the middle of it. I was staggering and, sta and I couldn't walk. And, and, there's, and I've been in meetings where the Lord began to do that and people get up and walk out and, and reject it. Well, why would the Lord do that? Be not drunk with wine where is excess, but be filled. It's a contrast. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled. There's a contrast. And the Lord gave me a principle just recently that all these years that I've had that, I was in a meeting recently where there was almost 100 people on the floor laughing hysterically. And the Lord is beginning to move, and, I, and the Lord showed me why. In his first coming, the Lord came to, to a young maiden named Mary. And the angel Gabriel said, the Lord has need of your body, your body, to birth his purpose into the earth. And Mary said, that's impossible, because she's looking at her present circumstances. She said, I'm not married. It's absolutely impossible. I, know, I don't know a man. It's impossible. And she said, and I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. But she said something else. She said, what? Be it unto me according to your purpose. She said, I don't under it's impossible, and I don't understand, but I'm willing Today, 
The Lord is forming a corporate Mary to birth his purpose, the his end time purpose, which is going to form and begin to function. And right now, much of what we're hearing may seem like noise, but as we listen and continue and reach out and allow the Lord to push us out from the shore and to sit down and teach us, and we begin to launch out into the deep and let our net down, we're, that, that noise, and we're gonna to begin to receive a response, understanding, and that noise will become a song. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall what? Reign on the earth. A higher level of understanding. We've got to be willing to go beyond. And the Lord showed me that new wine. You see, there's a reason why we're edified when we speak in tongues. He that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. I can tell you why. When I pray in English, if I'm anointed and I'm praying in English, a revelation starts to come. My head hears it and I start to think about it. And I measure it by what I already know. And I lose it. I lose it. it, it it's decreased in value. But if I'm praying in tongues, I'm praying mysteries that I don't understand. But, they're, they're, but because I'm praying in tongues, a heavenly language, that word's going into my spirit where it, where it, where it will solidify and begin to expand and it'll become understanding and it will gradually move into my understanding and I'll hear myself up here saying things that I don't know. It's happened many times. I hear myself saying things I don't know. Why? Because it's moved from my spirit up into my understanding. So when I pray in tongues, I'm not going, I can't limit it because I don't know what I'm saying. So I can pray profound things into my spirit. And then it will begin to move up into my understanding, gradually. And so, new wine, when that, that, that is an abiding principle. I have it, and it works on me. And what it does is this. When, when I come under the influence of that, I don't always act rationally, my mind, but I can I begin to become expressive and say and do things that I wouldn't otherwise do. And so it's, this is an end time blessing where the Lord is preparing us for a greater release of his glory, where, where we come under the influence of new wine and we're released from our understanding and we begin to allow him to express his life through us in a greater measure. And I've had the experience of explaining things to people that later I wrote down or I, so I wouldn't forget because I didn't have a clue. And they would have thought I knew all my life. And I did not have a clue. And I'm explaining to them like I always knew. That new wine, there's a release in that. So then the Lord is taking us, the Lord is taking us beyond our present level of understanding. He's pushing us out. From, the, from, from our present experience and getting us ready for that deeper thing. Deep calls to deep. And we're being prepared and made ready to, for that new song to find its full issue flowing out from our lives into its higher purpose. The next one, we won't spend much time on this, but Matthew chapter 13, I've been fascinated by this for a good many years. The seed. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 19 tells us that this seed is the word of the kingdom. You see, it's in seed form, and we don't really understand. But it's sown in seed form. And like any seed, it has to fall into fertile soil if it's going to germinate. Therefore, and I'm aware of this in the, in the recent months, the Lord has been speaking to me about, about my life and what I'm doing about separation, to maintain a separation from many things, perfectly all right and acceptable, but a separation that there'll be that fertile soil. 
that the word of the kingdom can find a higher level of release within my life. And the Lord is speaking to me about that. So then, Matthew chapter 13, verse 4, when he sowed, this is the word of the kingdom, a sower went forth to sow. Deep calls, a sower went forth. As God is the seeking God. He's always working, looking for a response within those whom he's seeking out. Some seed fell by the wayside. Now, being in the will of God or out of the will of God. The will of God is never further than one step from where you are. If you feel like you're out of the will of God, the will of God is one step away. And I'll explain myself. When you plant a garden, if you have a little garden, you have a row, right? And it's your hoe carefully. And you have to water and pull weeds. So, what, so what's beside the row? A path. You're with me? You've got a path that you walk on, then another row. Well, the path is where you walk. And because you walk on it to water, to pull weeds, to check on the growth, you're only one step, actually, you're one step from the furrow. It's not that far. But if the seed falls in the furrow, it's been, it, the soil's been prepared and made ready, and that speaks of our lives, of a separation and preparation to hear more clearly. It becomes fertile soil, and that seed grows and germinates. But if the seed falls in the wayside, what happens? It's hard. The birds will come and eat it. It'll, it'll get scorched in the sun. It, it, does, it can't grow. It can't take root. The soil's hard. But it's only one step. So if I'm out of the will of God, all I got to do is say, Lord, I repent, and I ask to be in your will. And I'm going to take that step. And I do it literally. I take a, Lord, one step. Now, see, that's all. Now I'm in your will. Now lead me from here. I may have lost some time. But now I'm back in his, just one step. I'm in the fertile soil, and that seed's going to begin again. I may have lost some time, but I'm back in his will. It's just one step. Some fell upon stony places. The word says, casting aside every sin and the weights. The word of the Lord is, come up. We read Revelation 3.20. Following that Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, John heard a voice saying, come up. That's a present word, come up. So if I'm going to climb and I've got a pocket full of stones, that's going to hinder. I'm not going to do very good. So what I do, if I'm going to climb, I get rid of what? All the stones. Not necessarily sin, but extra baggage, all kinds of things that are going to hinder my being able to come up into the presence of the Lord. I get rid of the stones. Stones are things. The will of God is first and primary. I step into it. Then I get rid of things that could hinder my coming up into his presence. Some fell amongst thorns. And I've shared this here before. And I've got a way to say this that I believe the Lord gave me. Roses are beautiful to look at, but never hug a rose bush. <laughs> I think you get the point. <laughs> those, those thorns are sharp. Uh, right? They are sharp. Now, the will of God, my positioning, stones, things that affect my life, thorns, attitudes, opinions. When you get close to somebody, you get a piece of their mind. <laughs> you know, they're thinking. And sometimes it pricks like it draws blood. It's pointed, it's sharp. It's like a thorn. And there has to come a correction. So if I'm going to flow in this, Others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirty. If I'm going to move into that area where the word becomes life, then I've got to deal with first the will of God. I had a specific word about Washington, D.C., and here I are. It would be nice to be somewhere else, but it's the, for me, it's the, I'm, I'm here because of a specific word. 
and I'm careful about where I go because of that. I'm careful about things. I do not have a TV set. Once upon a time, many years ago, I owned a TV cable system. And if I had stayed there and the Lord didn't meddle, <laughs> I would have been a multimillionaire today, literally. I owned a very, an ex, a system that is flourishing today. I would have been a multimillionaire. And someday I'd stand before the Lord and he'd say, well done, Wade Taylor, you've supplied television to thousands of people. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't know anything about any of this. You wouldn't be here. My whole life would be different. And in that day, I would weep when I saw what might have been. I would weep when I saw what might have been. You know, life is transitory. It's foolish to choose the pleasures of this life. They're only temporal and temporary. A man that I knew recently, 51 years old, was taking a nap and never woke up. You never, you know, I'm, so life, you know, we just don't know. Our life is in the Lord's hands. The important thing is not much done, it's well done. Thou good, godly, and faithful servant. So then, I'm going to deal with the will of God. I'm going to make sure that I'm there, that I'm in his will. I'm going to deal with the, with the wayside, be sure I'm in the center of his will. I'm going to deal with stones, things. I don't have a TV set because I want to keep my spirit open. The eye gate will pollute. So on purpose, I don't have one. Some fell amongst thorns. I'm very careful about attitudes and opinions that when I get corrected by the Lord, that I respond and, and, and make that correction and take care of it, that I can be ready then for that seed to germinate and develop in the good soil of my life, the pattern of my life, that I can become what the Lord would have me to be, a vessel in his hand for his end time purpose. And then the last one, and we're gonna finish with this, it's sex. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. We're familiar with it, but we all, see, when I, when I, when I come into, the, into his presence, when I'm available, then I'm going to believe for the greater manifestation of his presence. We are not changed from sermon to sermon, from tape to tape, from CD to CD, from DVD to DVD, <laughs> or conference or conference or convention to convention doesn't say that they're all good they all have a place but with an open face that is unveiled because I've got my life in order beholding as in a glass that's a mirror when someone has seen the glory of the Lord they're going to be very humbled not proud because the glory of the Lord is like a mirror and Isaiah, when he saw it, he said, woe is me, because he saw the glory, and in the glory he saw himself. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we're changed into the same image from repentance to repentance. You know, some say we don't have the glory because we need to repent. Have you ever heard that? That's not what it says. We need the glory so we can repent. Supposing I stop now and I said, I'm going to count to three, one, two, three, and we're all going to repent. Could you do it? No, you couldn't. You could cry crocodile tears, but you couldn't repent because repentance has to be given. You have to come into his presence. You've got to understand. You'd, see, it comes out of, out of the agony of a heart where we see and understand. It's got to come. So when I come into the glory, it's like a mirror. I'm going to see myself, and then I am, I'll tell you, I am going to repent. And I've been in that position where the holiness of God becomes so holy 
There isn't any language or words that you can express it, but you just melt in that presence, absolutely melt in that presence. We're changed from what? From glory to glory. That means this, I come into his presence, I see myself, and I make some corrections. The wayside, the stones, the thorns, I make some corrections, and then I come into a greater glory. When I come into the greater glory, I see myself more deeply, more fully, and I repent even more. And because I've repented even more, I come into a greater glory. And then I repent even more. But that's progressive. It's not a continual coming to the altar and promising the Lord all kinds of things that we never do. We've all done that. And I've had to repent of some of the things I come to the altar and told the Lord I do that I never did. We all do that, but that's not it. This is a progressive, ongoing thing of our lives being changed. So then the noise, our relationships, our lack of understanding about the end time, the things of the Spirit, if we'll just stick with it and we'll be patient. I'm just going to read that one more. Matthew chapter 13, one more that I did not write down. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 33. This confuses some because people think of leaven as being bad. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 33. Another parable spake he to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. So that's positive. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. Three measures. I am made up of what? Body, soul, spirit. That's three measures. The Lord is bringing a total redemption to me, to my spirit, my soul, and my body is being redeemed. There's a greater redemption of our bodies that's coming as a witness, a testimony. The three measures. So then the kingdom of heaven, when I begin to respond and my life comes into divine order, I begin to reap the benefits of kingdom living. And I'll live much more fully, completely, for the purposes of God. So the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. It's that deeper working of the Lord. I submit myself to it. And I receive that deeper working of the Lord until the totality of my being is brought into a, an alignment with the higher purpose of the Lord, the wheel within the wheel. And then I move in harmony with him until the whole was leavened. And so the Lord is bringing us. Right now, for some of us, it's a noise. For others, it's, it's beginning to form as a song. We're getting some light, some understanding. And for others, we're going to sing that song, the song of redemption, the song of Moses and the Lamb, brought up into that higher place of a cooperative relationship with the Lord and bringing redemption to humanity. And the Lord is, is leavening, cleansing, purifying each aspect of our life, body, soul, and spirit, the totality of our being is going to use Romans is 12, 1 is an end time, refers to the end time. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is, in effect, your spiritual worship. Present your bodies. We're in that time of the redemption of the body. And that leaven, that work of the spirit, of the power of God, that presence that's moving on us, it's going to bring us into a greater alignment with the purposes of God. And I thank the Lord for that. By the grace of God, each of us, we're going to become a partaker of that. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your purpose, your presence, your word.
Now we just sanctify this word. And we ask, Lord, for the full release of this word within each of our lives, that wherever we are in the progression of our spiritual experience, if we're in the multitude in John chapter 5, chapter 6, looking to see some miracles or some stones appearing or whatever, that's all good and it all has its place and it's all a witness. But you're taking a people further to include that, but Lord, to go beyond it. And we're asking, Lord, that there might be that release into our spirits of that deeper work of your grace. Cause this word to become a present reality within our lives. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, just let that word now be anointed and solidified deep within our spirit. Take it out of our mind and move it down to our spirit. And we thank you, Lord, and we glorify you. And we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful time together, our fellowship that will follow. We ask protection for those that are driving or flying. And very carefully, Lord, we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.